If you like what you hear in today's episode, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Curiosity. People have been ruminating about the idea, well, almost since people were first curious about anything at all. Is it a trait? Is it a superpower? Are people born with it? What makes some folks so fascinated with everything around them? People like Steve Jobs. Stay hungry, stay foolish. And Leonardo da Vinci. You can see a creative genius letting his mind connect science to art. And so you see a playful curiosity, a playful exploration of a mind dancing from topic to topic. And Katherine Johnson. Johnson helped chart the flight path for America's first space mission with Alan Shepard, the woman enchanted by numbers, now counted as a true American hero. While other people seem not to be so curious at all. And then there are children whose brains have millions more neuro connections than those of adults, albeit disordered connections. Why can't a dish break a hammer? Why, oh, why, oh, why? Cause a hammer's a hard head. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Why, oh, why, oh, why, oh. Why, oh, why, oh, why? Because, 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 because. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. One study estimates that children from two to five years old ask more than 100 questions per hour of their caregivers. Why indeed? And does our response affect whether children keep asking questions into their adulthood, never losing what Albert Einstein called a holy curiosity? In this episode of the Ohio State University Inspire podcast, we talk to STEM education experts about the power of curiosity to drive learning over a lifetime, and to teachers who venture outside the box to keep children asking why, how, and what if. And we ask an Ohio State psychology researcher about his work comparing the curious exploration of children and adults. His findings might surprise you and leave you asking questions of your own. Why can't a bird eat an elephant? Why, oh why, oh why? Cause an elephant's got a pretty hard skin. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. I'm Robin Chenoweth. Carol Del Grosso is our audio engineer. Inspire is a production of the College of Education and Human Ecology. Theodore Chow is an associate professor of math education in Ohio State's College of Education and Human Ecology. If you followed Inspire for a while, he was featured in our third episode back in 2020. I wanted to pick Dr. Chow's brain about how curiosity can ignite interest in anything. I was thrilled when he brought along Sophia Jung, assistant professor of science education in the college. I read something that said that people shouldn't be afraid to look without finding, uh, just allowing curiosity to guide you. I'm wondering how you both define curiosity. Robin, you just asked us to define curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's your definition um, of curiosity? I think curiosity is just a way for everything to interact and be entangled with one another. I think a lot of us, when we have children, we recognize just how important curiosity is. Our kids are not going to do something unless they're curious about it or unless they're trying to figure something out. And yet, you know, so much of schooling, particularly in my world of math education, math is taught in ways that do not value children's curiosity. It's just thought, hey, here's the Pythagorean theorem, and here's the formula, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Memorize it, and then now let's do a problems where you just mimic that. It sort of takes away the child's right to be curious, right? The child's right to sort of struggle with something, recognize a pattern, and see if that's true or not. Particularly in Western culture, we have this idea of the hero's quest, and the idea that the quest itself there's an end goal to find the ring or to save the kingdom. That's not actually that important. What happens during the journey is more important. And so I think I, I like what you're saying is look without finding. That journey of trying to figure out what it is you're finding is more important than actually finding. <laughs>
what you need to set out to do. Thing. Because it's where yeah, the change exactly. happens, right? Yeah. And just if yeah. I if I could add, Teddy, I love that you connected it back to education and children's curiosity. So like, knowledge is not fixed. So I love what you said. Like, if we don't allow children's curiosity, we're taking their right to to that exploration, right? That process of exploration. So I think that was really beautiful. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. Which makes me think. Okay, I want to take you back to when you're children because I know Dr. Jong, your story, the story which I love so yeah. much about flying uh, the kite. So I grew up in the rural part of Korea. Other than our faculty housing, everything was just rice fields. We had a deer farm behind us. There's such a thing as a deer farm. <laughs> we had a deer farm right behind us. We were just surrounded by woods. So I remember my parents, my mom and my dad, just letting me and my sister run wild, like feral children, into the woods. And one of the school projects that I had was go build a kite. My mom went to a store and bought a kit, like a kite kit with all the sticks and the papers and the instructions and whatnot. And my mom said, go outside and just build it. It was a really windy day. And then there was an elderly grandfather like figure just walking towards me. He comes up to me and he goes, children these days, they just don't know how to build a kite. And he's just like, child, let me, let me help you with this. Then he went, go run back home and tell your mom to grab me a bowl of rice. And I'm just like, bowl of rice? Why? <laughs> My mom, of course, like she, okay, here. Like doesn't even ask, why do you need a bowl of rice? So I run back downstairs, takes it, and he like smushes it between his finger. And he like glides it across the bamboo stick. He uses newspaper to like build out the tail. And that's when I started to realize, oh, yeah, kite is something that I need to fly. So there's the wind and the tail was what's going to balance the kite. So he didn't actually instruct the way of building a kite, but he kind of almost like showed me how to do it. And then I was kind of doing some sense making there. We flew that kite for like hours. Wow. Yeah. And then he just walked away. I love that story on yeah. so many yeah. levels. First of all, I mean, like, how does that relate to curiosity? What he was doing was just so interesting. So I couldn't like get my eyes off of what he was doing. And so like I was just engaging with him. I was interacting with him. I was interacting with the materials that came in the kit differently because he was showing me a different way to interact with it. I love that this guy sort of popped up, was grumpy and angry, and yet in that sort of like dismissal of you, actually sat down, taught you a valuable life lesson, right? <laughs> and did something that you, you, you hold on to the rest of your life and then just walked away. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he, just, he just left. The common theme in that story is that there were always adults who let me be curious. So my mom let me just be when I asked for a bowl of rice, like she didn't interrogate me about like, why do you need it? She's just like, okay, go, yeah, go play. All right, there's an element of play there too. And adults who are in my life to give me that space. So I think that's one takeaway that I always share with my pre-service teachers. It's almost our ethical obligation to make space for children's curiosity. Here's Shira Lee two-time alum of the college and a first grade teacher at Ohio Avenue Elementary School in Columbus, talking about her strategy for harnessing curiosity in a former class that was struggling to learn to read. Her trick? She first engaged the kid most reluctant to learn. And I just said, how can I get y'all to read and write? Like, how can we do this? He raised his hand and I said, yeah. He was like, I want to blow up stuff. And I said, we can do that. And he was like, really? I said, we can blow it up. If you can read about it and you can write about it, we can do it. Like, I'm all about that. And I, we set off several explosions that year. <laughs> and the kids came up and then it became a science year. They learned how to make hypotheses. And it was like, well, what do you think is gonna happen? And the number one guess for everything was it will explode. Of course, not everything explodes. 
but they did. We did the Mentos and Coke. We did volcanoes. You name it. We probably found a way to get it to explode. And it was like, now we have to write. They had the steps. And then they tried the steps. The monthly baking project and the moon phases. So we made moon cookies, but they had to write the list of steps we had to do. And it, it was fun. They ended up reading and writing on grade level by the end of the year. You spark their curiosity. Tell me your secret. Like you were, you're just imaginative. Me being imaginative, meh. Them, yeah. I just ask them, what do you want to do? And if they say what they want to do or what they want to learn about, then I try to incorporate it into what we're doing. And that's how we end up snowballing into whatever mess we get into. I bet they like learning with you though, right? I've heard that some people like it, you know, like I'm the one, I always say my classroom is like Vegas. What happens in here stays in here. Do not embarrass me when we go out in public. This strategy applies to adults too. Come on, have you baked a moon phase cookie lately? Better yet, have you gone beyond the answer you found in Wikipedia to read a book about something that really interests you? Or figured out how to upend an outdated system at work? Because you can. How curious are we? And how much does it have to do with the ways we were taught to be curious? Here's a passage from Curious, the desire to know and why your future depends on it. Curiosity disdains approved pathways, preferring diversions, unplanned excursions, impulsive left turns. In short, curiosity is deviant. Mm. I was going to ask if that's something that we've gotten away from. That sort of, I want to call it guileless search for answers. Is it something that, uh, something else taking its place in education, in the workplace, in academia? I would say that it's actually something that we do really well in the United States. You know, like Dr. Jung and I have, have both um, have international experience. I just came off of this amazing trip where I got to work in Indonesia and Vietnam. And I think that in a lot of other countries, like to become academically or to use academics to sort of excel often involves a very rigorous pathway. But what I think we as Americans do, people in the United States do, is we actually foster a lot of individual creativity. It's easy to look at things like the TIM scores, the PISA scores, and look at these international metrics of how the United States is doing. And we often go, oh, you know, the United States is not doing that well. But, you know, those metrics are really just looking at things like math achievement, and they're not looking at things like creativity. Looking at where the best engineers come from. And even if they're not necessarily from the United States, a lot of them are getting degrees from the United States. Here in the United States, we teach a lot of group projects, problem solving. And, and the ways that you have to really look at complex problems and think outside the box in order to solve them. I think that that's actually something we do well. I would say there is a trend now in K-12 through education of standardizing what education is, teachers being confined in what they can and cannot teach, and how much time they have to be creative. That is actually getting to what you're getting. You're talking about, Robin, is really removing curiosity, removing the individual element out of education. Yeah, I, I have to agree with what Dr. Chow said. I think the framework broadly for STEAM or STEM education to foster science and engineering mindset, problem solving mindset is there. I think so next generation science standards, which is focused on the practices, cross cutting concepts, as well as content areas. But I think if you drill down to the local level and day to day interactions and the challenges that we hear from our teachers who are truly amazing and doing amazing work, there seems to be an emphasis on immediate results, immediate outcomes that are measurable. Being able to measure student achievement is not a bad thing, but when that becomes just one more barrier that teachers have to navigate, then, you know, maybe we need to, I don't know, start to think about ways to, to support teachers a little differently. We're pretty tough on our teachers, aren't we? We are pretty tough on our teachers. It's yeah. tough, yeah. It's really yeah. hard. It's really, I think right now it's, it's, it's one of the darkest times in public education. In what ways? I, I think that teacher autonomy is almost gone. I, I think that, you know, right now it's, um, we're recording this in February, right? A lot of us who work in K-12 schools recognize that after the Super Bowl, testing season is on the horizon. And testing season takes over a large chunk, not just of physical time, but just sort of the 
emotional, mental energy for the teachers and our students. And it really just, it becomes this fog that really just sort of overtakes a lot of what we want to do in the spring. So much emphasis on testing, so much emphasis on performance, so much emphasis on what Dr. Jung was saying, immediately measurable results. Even so, some teachers rock at making testing material relatable to their students. Lindsay Rice is a third grade teacher at Ohio Avenue Elementary School who puts her neuroscience training to work in the classroom. Here's Rice talking about a science class she taught in Charlotte, North Carolina. One of the standards is weather. It was very boring and very far removed. You can't touch a cloud. You can't see a weather front. And so we started rewriting popular songs into music videos of, so like, the whip and nene is now El Nino in the Pacific. The kids were able to learn these dances and these songs the same way they're actively engaged in dance and other things that pique their interest. And my students, we went from an F to a B in science in three years. And what we found was when they would take those state tests is they would be dancing. You can remember the motion, then the motion will elicit the information from your brain. That might be because the same part of the brain that helps plan and execute movement, the caudate nucleus, has also been linked to learning, memory, reward, motivation, emotion, and believe it or not, romantic interaction. It ferries dopamine. So when Copernicus described the unbelievable pleasure of mind he experienced while exploring the universe, he was describing the same surge of pleasure people have enjoying food or falling in love. But really, can curiosity do all that? It can. Curiosity arises from the right balance between the familiar and the novel, experts say. If you know a little about something, you want to fill in the gap in your information to know more. Think about that true crime podcast you listen to to figure out who done it. But when you find out who the murderer was, you might forget the episode altogether. The trick is to not just satisfy novel curiosity, but create enduring curiosity, what experts call epistemic curiosity, by asking deeper questions. This especially works when fostering curiosity in students. Here is Kim Styers, a college alum, and Wendy Leon, both English language arts teachers at Indian Springs Elementary. There's rarely a time when I will say the answer to that is, well, what can you do to find this answer? Trying to get them to be more critical thinkers. I feel that many students don't have the confidence in themselves to really problem solve or be risk takers. And I think that both Wendy and I set up the environment or the questioning to help them be more curious or to grow as students. As educators, being able to tap into what gets that curiosity sparked in kids, providing an environment where they can feel they can ask those questions and, you know, we can provide opportunities and experiences that generate a curious response. I also teach language arts, so earlier this year we read a book about a Mars rover fiction. But with that, they were so engaged and so curious about planet Mars, the rovers, you know, how, how does this happen? So then you just dive into that curiosity. We ended up making rovers. We ended up dropping them out the two-story window with an egg in them to see if that was a successful Mars landing. Here's Sophia Jung talking with Theodore Chow about a conversation she had with her neighbor's children. So we had a 45-minute conversation about trying to make sense of this puzzling picture. And I actually have a transcript of that conversation that I use in my pre-service teacher class to show them the talk moves to foster curiosity and generative questions and using students' prior knowledge and their lived experiences to build on that. Can you remember any of the questions you asked them? Quintessential teacher talk moves, like, how do you know? What do you notice? What do you see? I've learned to stop using the word why. You're basically judging the kid. You're asking them to explain themselves, and it can feel very confrontational. So I would say, like, when you ask these questions, try not to use the word why. Try asking, how do you know? What do you see? What do you notice? Young children are so naturally inquisitive. 
But as they grow, it can seem like we, their parents and educators, have to goad their curiosity. Maybe we even have to goad ourselves. I should read more books. I should take up a hobby. What happens? As we age, neural pathways in our brains become more defined, efficient, and automatic. As we figure things out, curiosity in some people begins to wane, but not in everyone. My name is DeAndrea Jones. I am a pre-K teacher at Wylam Park Elementary School with Columbus City Schools. Jones, who listens in on the conversations of four-year-olds and uses them as a springboard for her own exploration. I often wander in an imaginary world myself, (laughs) and so that kind of helps me to relate with the students. That might lead her to build a racetrack or apply for a dream grant to study diverse book illustrators, or to dress up as a football player. Yes, she has done all that. Back to the idea of not having any limits. Uh, Wherever that idea can take me, I want to see if I can explore and tap into those different ideas and take the kids along with me when I can. Do you think that as adults, we can lose our curiosity? Yeah, I definitely think that um, that can happen. Sometimes as adults, we get kind of a a set way that we think that things should be. Um, so if we are one of those adults, and there's space in this world for all of us, but <laughs> just to take time to explore other things, uh, explore new things uh, so that you can kind of keep yourself fresh and free and flexible. What also helps me, as I said, is listening to the students. Listening to children. What a novel idea, because kids notice and see things that we often miss. Vladimir Slutsky, a professor of psychology at Ohio State, has studied just that. If you're sorting things into, by shape, let's say, that the, your attention is focused on shape and other things are irrelevant. In other words, Adults have a tendency to tune out the extraneous information. Young children do not. And one of the questions that we asked ourselves was, why is that? It's obviously great because it supports learning. It also puts children in many situations at an advantage. And I have papers demonstrating that, yes, it may be not great, for academic environments, but it may be good for other things, giving them advantage of noticing things that adults miss. One study Slutsky did showed adults and children an array of stick figures and then changed certain features. The adults zeroed in on what had changed, but the children noticed everything else, demonstrating much better recall of the static portions of the images. But why do they do that? The possibility is that they really value information and they tend to sample broadly no matter what they do, whether they sample the environment with their eyes or they sample with their actions when they open all kinds of doors and taking all kinds of objects out. One thing that we know is that they're not random. They're clearly not random. One experiment displayed a screen with quadrants each with a creature offering different amounts of virtual candy, which children could later exchange for stickers. Adults quickly figured out which creature gave the most reward and chose it consistently. The kids, more driven by curiosity, sampled and resampled, but they did so in a completely non-random way. So what does that tell us about kids then? It tells us a lot. It tells us that the longer that the time passes since the last choice, the more uncertainty there is as to what's in this location. So as they become more uncertain, it becomes more novel. And so as they're attracted to novelty, they tend to select this option, whereas the option that was just chosen, it's sort of old news. So the kids chose in the same order they did before driven by the novelty of the choice. They were looking for what's new. And that points to a big difference in the way we learn. We consistently and constantly face a dilemma. And that is that human children didn't evolve to learn in academic settings. And yet, 
learning in academic settings is necessary. I think that if there is one piece of advice, it would be think about how children act in a natural environment. Their attention is all over the place. So do we want their attention to be all over the place in the classroom? The answer is no. The only way to minimize that, unfortunately, theoretically, is to make classrooms extremely boring and the only interesting piece of information coming from the teacher. So it's exactly the opposite of of what we do. Wow, that wasn't what I was expecting you to say (laughs) at all. (laughs) We learned a long time ago when we conduct experiments, if we want to finish the experiment, if we want the child engaged and enjoy it, the room itself should be excruciatingly boring, with gray, gray color, no light. So the only interesting information comes from the computer And that's where their attention should be attracted to. And then Dr. Slutsky astounded me with another idea that I hadn't considered. Maybe it wouldn't be good if everyone was curious on the level of Steve Jobs and Leonardo da Vinci. Is curiosity necessary for society and for us to move forward? And you're saying only for certain people. What I'm saying is that it is absolutely absolutely necessary for children. And then curiosity is necessary in the society, in sort of isolated groups of people who can harness, who should harness and exploit it. I'm not sure that it is a really good property if everybody in the society becomes like that. Just think about if everybody if everybody is attracted to novelty and everybody is constantly exploring. So we will be having people who constantly change jobs because it's more interesting to be in the new job and learn something new. And so it will be very difficult to have any continuity in a society like that. So I think that a healthy mix of people who are attracted by novelty and people who are attracted by familiarity sort of makes it both. So we can both have stability, but also some exploration within the confines of stability. Mm. Okay. And I'm thinking back to that book that I read, Leonardo da Vinci only completed a very small number of the paintings that he started. (laughs) Really? <laughs> yes, he left a, he left a trail behind him of angry people, patrons who had paid and he never completed. Well, that's uh, a classical example of a novelty driven person. Now we imagine the entire society like <laughs> that. a carpenter started and dropped, a builder started and b- dropped, a doctor, a garbage collector, a teacher. All of them just started and then dropped. I mean, we would face collapse. I mean, it's going to make them read the book, right? It's going to make them pursue a new hobby or whatever to enrich their lives, right? Yes. But also, if we think about it as something that comes in different quantities, then I think that it's great that it is distributed in the population from like zero to very high quantities rather than everybody having an extremely high quantity. I get his point. Some people rush to see what's behind the closed door. Others are comfortable never opening it. The world needs a balance. But the romantic in me still believes that we could use a few more Leonardos, a few more Mae Jemisons and Amanda Gormans, a few more Rachel Carsons, to help the rest of us see the possibilities and believe that we can create something better. As Sophia Jung said, We have ethical obligation to really nurture that curiosity and children's wonder. Maybe the answer really does lie in giving all children all the support they need to be curious and become the people they were meant to be. Letting ourselves listen in 
on their curious inquiry and be inspired.